Inflammation is one of the biggest problems that we have, not only in this country, but around the world that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Inflammation is the cause of so many diseases like cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, heart disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Did I say that right? Ulcerative? Ulcerative. Causes ulcers. COPD, asthma, and even autoimmune disease. Some studies have shown that inflammation could even be a cause of cancer. Now what is inflammation? What does it do to the body? What can you do to fix it or can you fix it? And can you prevent it? Well, I'm not a doctor. I don't give medical advice. So in this video, I've brought together a group of five doctors that are gonna answer all these questions and many more that you might have. And the answer to some of these questions might be a lot simpler than what you think. Now what these doctors are not gonna do is tell you to take a bunch of pills, painkillers. They're gonna tell you how to heal this so you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Your body is perfectly capable of healing itself with the right formula. They're gonna tell you about the right formula. And make sure you stick around till the end of the video because one of these guys is gonna show you a surprising food that's the number one food that you can eat to fix inflammation. He's gonna tell you what it is and why it works. So let's go ahead and get right into this, answer all your questions about inflammation right after this. So in this first clip, Dr. Mark Hyman, who I've not featured in any of these videos yet, is gonna show you the top three things that cause inflammation and how to prevent it. Check this out. So people know that if you have a sore throat, it's red, painful, swollen, and, and um, that's inflammation and it hurts, right? The, the, the ancient description of inflammation was rubor, cholera, dolor, and tumor. So tumor is swelling, rubor is redness, dolor is pain, and um, cholera is heat, right? So we have to understand that those are, the, those are the cardinal features of inflammation. But then you go, well, I don't really feel inflamed. My throat doesn't hurt. My joints aren't swollen. I don't have a rash. What do you mean by inflammation? It's, it's what we call hidden or silent inflammation. And that is the problem. It's the inflammation that we don't see, that we can't feel, that's causing all the chronic diseases that we see today. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, depression, not to mention obviously autoimmune disease, allergies and so forth. Those, we know there's inflammation in those, but I mean, do people think of being overweight as an inflammatory state? Do people think of diabetes as an inflammatory state? Do people think of depression as an inflammatory state? No, but inflammation is causing all of those chronic diseases. So back to your question, what are the biggest drivers of inflammation? Well, it's something that has been only recently uh, a phenomena in traditional medicine and has been ignored pretty much forever, except by functional medicine, which is your gut, your microbiome. Turns out that 60 to 70% of your immune system is in your gut. Why is it there? Well, it's the place where you're exposed to all the foreign materials that every day more than anywhere else. The purpose of your immune system is to identify friend from foe and to get rid of the bad stuff. So when you're eating pounds of a foreign material, namely food, and you have three pounds of foreign material in there, namely bacteria, that's a lot to handle. So the ability of the gut to sense what it should take in, to keep out the things that shouldn't be in there is so important. And so having a healthy microbiome allows us to properly regulate our immune systems and to let in the nutrients that we need, proteins, the amino acids, the fatty acids, the sugars and carbohydrates that we need, the nutrients we need, but it keeps out all the bad stuff. First line of defense. So when that barrier gets broken in the gut, all of a sudden your immune system is exposed to a sea or actually more accurately exposed to a sewer. <laughs> and, and so that starts to piss off your immune system and you start to create systemic inflammation. So the microbiome is, is really important and we're just beginning to understand how to identify what's out of balance in there and how to correct the system. Traditional medicine is still very much behind the eight ball on this. Functional medicine is way ahead by 30, 40 years on understanding one, how to identify dysfunction in the gut, how to repair a leaky gut, how to reduce inflammation, how to restore a normal microbiome. Uh, there's a, a famous Ayurveda quote uh, that really 
says, if your gut's not healthy, you're not healthy. And if you want to fix disease, focus on the gut. So this has been known for a long time. Uh, actually, this idea wasn't new. Uh, Eli Metchnikoff at the turn of the 1900s was a scientist who first came up with the notion of the gut as a source of chronic illness. Uh, they had some wacky ideas about how to deal with it, which was take out your colon, <laughs> which I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> but they were on the right track, which is problems in the microbiome and the gut cause systemic disease. And the solution is not cutting out your colon, it's fixing the gut. But, but it was, it's not something that new. Uh, the other big source of inflammation is our diet and not any um, random thing from our diet, but the amount of starch and sugar in our diet that drives uh, a dysfunction in our metabolism called insulin resistance. It's essentially like uh, where we become resistant to the effects of insulin and our bodies need to make more and more insulin to regulate our blood sugar. And that is because we're flooding our system with pharmacologic doses of starch and sugar, about a pound a day per person, which is just historically unprecedented. And that insulin resistance causes the development of specific kinds of fat cells. They're called adipocytes. They're specific kind of fat cells in the gut around your belly, your belly fat, that produce a class of compounds called adipocytokines. Cytokines you might have heard about with COVID are the cytokine storm. These are the messenger molecules of your immune system. And when you have a lot of these belly fat cells made from eating starch and sugar caused by ins too much insulin and insulin resistance, it creates systemic inflammation. So it literally puts your body on fire. So if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you have heart disease, if you have dementia, these are all related to this phenomenon of too much starch and sugar and the systemic inflammation. We now know that, for example, if you have high cholesterol and no inflammation, there are very little risk for heart disease. But if you have high cholesterol and high inflammation, those are the people who are at risk for heart disease. So when you start to look at inflammation in the body, it's not what we can feel, but there are ways of measuring through laboratory testing the amount of inflammation in our body. But insulin resistance is a big driver of inflammation because it makes your belly on fire, literally. And these fat cells are just pumping out tons of inflammation throughout your body. The third thing that is really important to understand is that stress is inflammatory. Chronic stress causes inflammation in the body through a number of different mechanisms. One, stress makes you insulin resistant, so it'll contribute to just making you overweight and belly fat. Sometimes stress can be a very big factor in insulin resistance. It also um, affects your your inflammatory response and creates an increased inflammatory response. So your mind, your really your your brain is the most potent pharmacy ever. And it will drive either inflammation or it will stop inflammation simply by your thoughts. So you have to kind of look at that and 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 that's something we haven't talked about a lot, but is how do we master our minds? Most of us are victims of our mind's activity and we train our muscles, we train our body, we increase our metabolism. Nobody knows how to train their brain to actually function better from the perspective of being in control of your thoughts. And that is, that's a, not an easy one. Um, you know, we've got religious conflict, political conflict. Uh, we've got the divisiveness in this country where we had sort of a takeover of the capital by, by a whole bunch of people who were, you know, hopefully making the world a better place. But really, that was not a very helpful act. So why is that happening? Well, it turns out that uh, your brain when it's inflamed, it doesn't work. And all the things that we see as behavioral disorders, as violence, as depression, anxiety, mood disorders, the opioid crisis, turns out that a lot of these things are driven by inflammation in the brain. And, and what's happening often is that the inflammatory process diet that we have the changes in our microbiome because of our diet, because of C-sections, antibiotics, and toxins, and all the things that damage our gut microbiome, because of glyphosate, all that leads to inflammation. And when you have inflammation like that in the body, it disconnects the ancient limbic brain, the reptile brain, the fight or flight response from the frontal lobe, which is basically the adult in the room, your executive function, your higher self. So when your higher self and your lower self are not talking to each other, when your survival brain and your sort of mature, grown-up brain that makes sure you don't do or say or 
act in ways that are damaging or harmful to other people, that connection gets weakened or it breaks. And so when you look at, for example, diet studies in prisons or in juvenile detention centers, it's so impressive because simply swapping out healthy food, an anti-inflammatory diet for an inflammatory diet in prisons cuts a violent crime by 56%. You know, a lot of stuff started off with good intentions that had bad consequences, right? In the uh, post-World War II era, we needed to scale up agriculture to feed a hungry world, a growing population, to produce a lot of cheap carbohydrate, starchy calories. And we did a great job. <laughs> we did a great job. The average American has 500 more calories than they did in 1970 available to them to eat, and they're eating it, which is why we're all so unhealthy. That was a good idea, but the unintended consequences have been devastating, not only to human health in terms of diabetes and obesity. I mean, when I was born, there was a 5% obesity rate. Now it's 40. It's an eightfold increase in obesity in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, but we've also created unintended consequences for the environment and, and climate and the changes in our in our biodiversity and loss of species and the damage to the soil and our water systems because of how we're growing food. So we've created all these unintended consequences. In the same way, you know, these, these food companies, we're not actually designing foods to drive all these problems, but we're locked in a system where the status quo is trying to be preserved so they can maintain their market share and their profitability. And they're trying to navigate and figure out how to shift because culture is shifting, demand is shifting. But, you know, we, we have a, a tremendous amount of money that goes into preserving the status quo, how we grow food, what we grow, the processed food industry, the marketing of the food. I mean, we spend billions of dollars um, from the food industry, gets spent billions of dollars marketing and advertising bad foods. And the worse the food, the more money they spend advertising. Uh, and and what's worse is it's it's hidden advertising now that's really a problem. And so these algorithms on, the, on these um, social media drive you into more and more of the same. So if you click on a conspiracy, one conspiracy theory, you're gonna get fed 10 other conspiracy theories. <laughs> so I met these people that believe in all these weird, seemingly disconnected conspiracy theories because that's that's the universe they live in. So we live in these self-reinforcing information bubbles that are driven by algorithms. And the algorithms were there designed to give people stuff they like, to show them if they want a nice pair of shorts or a bathing suit that they might like. Or, Again, well-intentioned. Well-intentioned, but the consequences now, we, we sort of, let the genie out and uh, it's out of control. Anybody with any chronic disease, inflammation is a player. Um, and, and, and so whether you have the typical things that we understand as inflammation like autoimmunity or allergy or eczema or skin disorders, or whether it's the silent inflammation that's causing heart disease and cancer and diabetes and obesity and Alzheimer's, anybody with a chronic condition is typically inflamed at some level. So my job is to then navigate and figure out what's causing it. Because when you get to the root of inflammation, you don't actually have to treat the diseases directly. I don't really treat diabetes. I don't treat Alzheimer's. I don't treat heart disease. I don't treat cancer. I simply change the biology of the body to normalize function, to reduce inflammation. And as a side effect, these things go away. And I think that's a really important concept because if we don't understand that um, root cause medicine is the way we need to go forward, then we're going to just be constantly spinning out on all these new drug treatments and spending billions of dollars to address this. I mean, they found out, oh, Alzheimer's is an inflammatory disease of the brain. So what do you have to do? Well, they did a whole study taking Advil. It didn't work and it caused all these side effects. Why? Because they didn't get to the root of the inflammation. Uh, recently, a big study came out on aspirin. Doctors have been saying, take aspirin to reduce inflammation, to prevent heart attacks. Well, I've, if you read my stuff over the years, I've always said, bad idea. There are maybe some people who would benefit, but aspirin is not a side effect free drug and kills as many people as asthma or AIDS a year because of bleeding, stomach bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, brain bleeding, strokes, hemorrhage. So the recent studies show that, oh, sorry guys, we were wrong. You can't just take aspirin to reduce inflammation and prevent heart attacks because it's gonna kill you. It's more likely to kill you than the heart attack, so stop taking it, which was a huge shocker because if you talk to any cardiologist, if you talk to any primary care doctor, everybody was on board. And 
I was kind of shocked because I looked at the actual science that was supporting this. And I even look at the American College of Cardiology risk calculator. There's actually a calculator on the American College of Cardiology website to put in whether or not you would either get harmed or have benefit from aspirin. And most of the people who are on aspirin actually don't even qualify or didn't qualify according to the previous guidelines. Now there's a whole bunch of people who, who shouldn't even according to those guidelines be taking it. So I think the, the, it's backwards to say we're going to shut off inflammation with anti-inflammatories or immune suppressants. I mean, they're talking about using drugs like Humira, which is a $50,000 a year anti-inflammatory drug that's used for autoimmune disease for depression. Why? Because depression is inflammation in the brain. The key isn't to shut off inflammation with the drug, is to get rid of the source of inflammation. It's just shocking to me that there really isn't a conversation about why. Oh, we know Alzheimer's is inflammatory. Oh, we know depression is inflammatory. We know heart disease is inflammatory. We know cancer is inflammatory. Okay, so we need to give you anti-inflammatory drugs. <laughs> There's no questioning of, gee, why in the first place is your immune system so pissed off? What's creating inflammation? And we know so much about it. It's not hard. It's, it's our diet, our inflammatory diet. It's stress. It's our microbiome issues. It's triggers that, for example, might be from latent infections or allergens or toxins. All these drive inflammation. So as a functional medicine doctor, my expertise is in being an expert in understanding toxins, allergens, microbes, stress, and diet, because those are the things that drive inflammation. And so every individual has a different cocktail of things that are off. But my job is to figure out what is their particular triggers and get rid of them. So we're eating too many inflammatory foods. 60% of our diet in America is ultra processed food, corn, wheat, and soy. And they're turned into all sorts of weird products. Uh, the corn is turned into all sorts of food additives and high fructose corn syrup. The wheat is turned into highly pulverized flour, which is highly inflammatory. The oils that come from soybeans and corn are often um, highly processed and inflammatory. So we're eating a lot of, of ingredients that are derived from these commodity products and ultra processed food that uh, we're not even aware of. So when you read maltodextrin or something on a label, you don't know where that came from. That's a byproduct of corn from the from a science project in the factory. Uh, when you eat high fructose corn syrup, same thing. So we're eating ingredients that are made from commodity crops. They're basically the same three ingredients made into all sizes, colors, shapes of, of chemically extruded food-like substances. So if you actually cover over the packaging and look at the ingredients, you literally would see the same ingredients on almost every processed food. We know with a few little tweaks here and there. And you can't actually even tell what it is by reading the ingredient list. That's an ultra processed food. If you buy a can of tomatoes and it says tomatoes, water, and salt, you know what that is. If the ingredient list is, you know, 14, 15, 35 items, um, and half of them you can't pronounce, don't recognize, and wouldn't have in your medicine cupboard or your kitchen cupboard, then you should not eat them, right? I mean, why should we be eating butylate hydroxytoluene or, or um, maltodextrin or all kinds of weird compounds that are not our natural food supply? So those are ultra processed foods and it's a huge component of our diet and it's highly inflammatory. So th that's 60% of calories on average. And when you think of all the people who don't eat that much processed food, the people who are eating it might eat 70, 80%. Right? When you average it all out over all Americans, it's about 60%. And kids, it's even worse. It's 70%. <laughs> 70% for kids. I think 67 and something. It's like terrifying to me. So that is really what we should be focused on not eating. It's driving inflammation. And sugar and starch is number one, two, and three. Um, all the food additives. We eat about five pounds of food additives a year, and they can be inflammatory. For example, all the thickeners, emulsifiers, things like carrageenan and gums that are used in processed food, uh, they often have something called microbial transglutaminase, which is a gluten product that they use to hold the food together. And all these emulsifiers, they cause leaky gut. So these damage your gut. And when you have a damaged gut, then guess what? The floodgates open, like we talked about earlier in the, in the, in the podcast. You start getting food proteins and bacterial proteins leaking into your bloodstream. Your immune system gets all pissed off and it creates this vicious cycle of inflammation. So eliminating all that 
weird stuff is so important. If you read the label and you don't know actually everything that's on there and you can't pr- pronounce it, you wouldn't have it in your medicine cabinet, don't eat it. Yeah, so we, we, we have a system in our body to control inflammation. And that system requires nutrients. And many of us are nutrient depleted. So, for example, a multivitamin will reduce C-reactor protein. And it does so by activating all sorts of enzymes. So vitamin, what are vitamins and minerals? They're basically helpers. One third of your entire DNA codes for enzymes. What do enzymes do? They turn one molecule to another molecule, one chemical to another chemical in your body. And all the enzymes we, need, we have require coenzymes or cofactors, helpers. And what are those? Those are vitamins and minerals. <laughs> and so some of us need a lot more of this one or that one. And if we're low, which a lot of us are, this is not my opinion. This is the, the government's own surveys and diagnostic testing and giant studies of tens and tens of thousands of people that over 90% of Americans are deficient in one or more nutrients at the minimum level you need to prevent deficiency disease. So not how much you need for optimal health or immune function, but how much vitamin D you need to not get scurvy? I mean, to not get rickets, not very much. How much vitamin C do you need to not get scurvy? Not very much. But how much vitamin C or vitamin D do you need to regulate your immune system and reduce inflammation? A lot more. So many of us are deficient in nutrients. So that's the mechanism. So our bodies were designed to deal with scarcity. And we have hundreds of genes that help control starvation. <laughs> <laughs> and put our bodies in a healing and repair state when we are lacking food. We have almost no genes that help us deal with abundance and excess, like the 500 extra calories of corn syrup that every American is exposed to since 1970. Right? So we, when we are in a state of scarcity, our bodies kick into action a whole set of mechanisms that reduce inflammation, that increase antioxidant systems, that build muscle, that get rid of fat, burn fat, which is good in the case of starvation, and that help to increase stem cell function and and many, many other beneficial factors, improve mitochondrial health, clean up your cells, get rid of waste. I mean, it's just, it's quite amazing what happens when you have scarcity, when you starve, (laughs) which is Good thing because you you want to keep alive as long as possible. So everything is in your body is like, I'm just going to fix everything so I don't die. So how do you get to that state? Well, there's a lot of techniques that are now being talked about and they all have the same mechanisms, whether it's time-restricted eating, which is eating within an eight hour, 10 hour, 12 hour window, whether it's intermittent fasting, which is having a 24, 36 hour fast once a week or more prolonged fast whether it's fasting, mimicking diets, which are calorie restricted diets for five days of 800 calories, whether it's a ketogenic diet, which restricts carbs and increases fat. That's actually what we get in when we're not eating. We get in a ketogenic diet. When when we don't have food, our bodies go in ketosis, but you can do that by eating more fat. So all those ways of eating actually activate the body's own healing mechanism. And what happens? Well, you reduce inflammation, you increase antioxidant systems, you increase stem cell production, you increase muscle, you increase bone density, you increase cognitive function and brain chemistry and neuroplasticity. You do all these things simply by activating these ancient healing systems that are designed to protect us from starvation. So it's kind of like controlled starvation in a way, and that's a good thing. And I think it's really it's really important for us to think about how we do those things on a regular basis. And I, I try to incorporate those strategies uh, regularly in my life. So the biggest driver of of chronic inflammation is stress, which drives all kinds of hormonal dysregulation. It screws up your hormones, the sex hormones, your insulin, blood sugar, uh, cortisol, adrenaline, and and it really drives huge amounts of inflammation. So if if you actually are, are highly stressed, that will drive a lot of the pathology. I mean, insulin is another hormone. That is a big one that drives inflammation. That's one of the biggest ones. We talked a lot about that. Um, You'll see people who are taking hormones, for example, estrogen or the birth control pill. And and depends on what you're taking. If you're taking, for example, Premarin, it raises inflammation in the body. It causes a high CRP. So does the birth control pill. (laughs) So a lot of people are taking the birth control pill. I'm not saying people should stop the birth control pill, but you want to make sure you mitigate the effects of that. And I uh, recently did an Instagram live with the founder of Even, uh, Sarah Morgan, talking about the ways in which, for example, medications deplete nutrients and affect the body adversely. So, for example, if you're on the pill, the birth control pill, you may need to take certain nutrients to mitigate the effects of that and help reduce inflammation. So certain things I would never take, like Premarin, 
which is a hormone that drives inflammation. But I, I certainly you know, wouldn't tell everybody to stop the birth control pill, but I think you have to know what you're doing and actually offset the harm by taking the right nutrients to, to actually mitigate the damage and the inflammation that comes from that. So now that we have a little bit of an understanding about the causes, I want to go to Dr. Sean Baker, who has a new study to talk about, about what really can heal inflammation. Let, let's look at the newest study that has just come out. A large meta-analysis published just the other day uh, looked at this question in particular. And what they did is they looked at all of the randomized controlled trials that tracked uh, markers of inflammation. Uh, so they ended up looking at 44 randomized control trials. So some meta-analysis of randomized control trials. This is, you know, many people would consider this as the highest tier of evidence. Now again, depends how good the randomized control trials are, honestly, but still this is very, very strong evidence. And what this study shows is that indeed a ketogenic diet tends to drive inflammatory markers down. But this matches the clinical experience that many of us have on ketogenic and carnivore diets that we just feel less inflamed. You know, we, and, and some of us ourselves have tested these things and seen things like C-reactive protein drop dramatically. Certainly on carnivore diets, people, one of the more common things they will say is they notice less inflammation. You know, it may, it may be it's uh, the, their joints feel less achy and, and irritated. Their gut seems less inflamed. You know, some people have, you know, really uh, sort of irritated skin which often improves. So this is just more evidence that matches our clinical experience. Again, you know, um, there are a lot of people that criticize a ketogenic diet because of, oh, it's not the only way to lose weight. But the reality is it's much more than that. You know, weight loss can be done a various number of ways. You know, you can obviously reduce caloric intake uh, and exercise more and you can lose weight that way. It's not that you can't do it. It's hard for many people to just do that and actually be successful with it. Clearly that's been difficult over the years. Otherwise we wouldn't have this huge obesity epidemic that we have. But irrespective of how you decide to lose weight, ketogenic diets seem to favor decreases inflammation. We're also seeing, you know, same thing with carnivore diets, we're also seeing incredibly uh, a wide diverse number of medical conditions that seem to improve uh, via this dietary strategy. Now another doctor that I've seen before but haven't put in any of these videos, but I feel like he has something really important to say about the ketogenic diet and how it can heal inflammation. Watch this. Yeah, that study was in people with metabolic syndrome for 12 mm -hmm. weeks duration. And uh, let me just say that you know, different researchers have their pet biomarkers. So sure. if somebody wants, you know, IL-6, somebody else likes, I mean, this sounds like alphabet soup here, um, uh, yeah. IL-1 beta or TNF alpha or IGF-1, um, PI-1. I mean, these are all, so rather than pick somebody's favorite and, and upset somebody else because they, we didn't pick their favorite, we studied 14 biomarkers mm -hmm. in these people after 12 weeks. Uh, at, after 12 weeks, um, for all 14, none of them had a superior response, that is a, a greater lowering in the high carbohydrate, low fat group. Mm -hmm. So none of them were better off compared to the, the low carb ketogenic group. The key, low carb ketogenic group, seven out of the 14 were not just lower, but significantly lower. Sure. So which, and both of them were weight, weight loss studies. They were, both groups lost weight. Yeah. But the ketogenic diet markedly and consistently downregulated a, a number of biomarkers, and by the way, those are also bioactive compounds. They're also doing things. So we were changing inflammation at a number of different cellular sites within the body in a, in a coordinated way, and we think that's much better than targeting one single biomarker and making that go down, is what, which is typically done with drugs uh, that are targeted for anti-inflammatory effects. Sure. Now one of my favorites, Dr. Eric Berg, he's gonna get into 10 things that cause inflammation, what you can do about it, and why you want to. Most of the inflammation that a person has actually is being caused by their own immune system. And we really have just two basic uh, phases of inflammation. You have the acute phase, and then you have the chronic phase, where you have this incomplete healing. Inflammation is there to try to heal something, but if there's a constant stimulus, which I'm gonna cover all of them today, you're not gonna get to a point where you can actually resolve it. So I wanna cover all of the different uh, things that can occur, and then I'm gonna cover all the things that you should do to resolve it. The number one selling drug in the world is an anti-inflammatory drug. So a lot of people have inflammation, but most autoimmune cases actually originate in the gut. 
But let's start with number one, gluten. Okay, that's in grains. Gluten really tears your stomach up. There's a morphine-like substance when you have this immune reaction. So in reality, it can numb the area so you don't feel it while the damage goes on. So gluten is behind so many different issues, okay? And then we also have food allergies, like intolerance to milk sugar, but that's not necessarily a true allergy. A true allergy involves a protein, like an allergy to casein, which is a protein in milk. So just by taking a person off milk, boy, all sorts of things can clear up. Number two, ultra-processed food ingredients that are made from industrial processed corn, okay? They go through huge uh, series of chemical reactions to the point where they no longer resemble the original corn. You've heard of corn starch and maybe modified food starch, this maltodextrin, highly reactive in the body. And so it behaves like a sugar, but it's classified as a starch. And then we have the deadly seed oils, which are again, highly refined. Well, a lot of people do dirty keto and they go to a fast food place. They eat the burger, not the bun. And they seem to do okay. You know, it's the bun with the burger and the ketchup and the soda and the fries all together that creates the problem. Now, if you like these compilation videos and they help you out, please consider sharing them with somebody you think they might help. And if you're not subscribed, it'll light up right down there for you. Just hit that subscribe button and you'll know anytime I make another video like this. You want to cook with tallow. You want to use uh, coconut oil extra virgin olive oil. You don't want to use vegetable oils, especially when you use heat. All right, number three, viruses. A lot of people have um, certain inflammatory conditions that come and go. That's because a virus kind of can go in remission and out of remission. All right, number four, insulin resistance, okay? If you're doing a lot of uh, snacks, frequent eating, and you're doing carbs, you can get insulin resistance. Most of the population has insulin resistance. The next one is just not enough cortisol. Let's say, for example, you went through chronic stress for many years or um, you had prednisone for a period of time. What happens, you develop what's called a cortisol resistance to the point where you don't have enough cortisol and then the body becomes inflamed. And the remedy is vitamin D. Number six, old injuries, and that is me, okay? I had a lot of old injuries. And it really has to do with a lack of motion. If a joint doesn't move, or if you don't move, you're sedentary, you will develop inflammation. All right, next one, sludge in your bile ducts, a super concentrated cholesterol material, okay? What keeps it from becoming a stone is bile salts. And when it starts to get stuck in your bile ducts, it backs up into the liver and causes pain in the right shoulder or in your rhomboid back here or in your neck. That can be corrected by a healthy diet. The next one is iron, too much iron. Some people feel so much better when they give blood because they have a, a genetic problem that they retain too much iron, especially men. One thing about iron, it doesn't get out of the body very easily. So if you're consuming like supplements, you might not even connect the dots, but that can be the reason why you feel worse. All right, next one, I wanna expand on this hypoxia situation. This is a lack of oxygen. If you have a chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD in your lungs, you can have hypoxia, you're not getting the oxygen. Hypoxia causes inflammation. All right, then the next one is uric acid. It's one of the main causes of high blood pressure, and it comes from consuming a lot of fructose, as in high fructose corn syrup. What can you do about this, right? You need to fix the, the microbes in the gut, the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria. And you can find those two in kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi, and just getting a probiotic. All right, the next thing, and this is really important, is to build up your endogenous antioxidants. The word endogenous means from within. So let's go through a couple things to do that. Fasting. Next one, cruciferous vegetables and salads. Exercise. Another thing is cold therapy. Next one on the list is vitamin D3, the most potent anti-inflammatory. Vitamin D can just put some order into your immune system that can help regulate that immune system a lot better. And at least 10 to 20,000 IUs. All right, number four, I already mentioned this, fasting. You should be doing 
regular intermittent fasting and periodic prolonged fasting if you have any inflammation. Number five, low carb. This is called keto. Number six, carnivore if you have got inflammation. Really, red meat is probably the, the most healing thing that you can possibly eat. And I'm talking about grass fed, grass finished. Now, the next one on the list, I talked about that bile sludge. The antidote to that is something called Tudka. Take two in the morning, two in the afternoon, empty stomach. It will open up those ducts and allow the sludge to get through and give you a tremendous amount of relief, especially if you have bloating or this right shoulder pain. Next one is tocotrienols. I already talked about that. Great for anything related to the heart. I already mentioned cold therapy as well. That's number nine. And I also mentioned number 10, stretching and exercise. And 11, omega-3 fatty acids, fish oils. I recommend the cod liver oil because it has the vitamin A and the vitamin D. If you compare the seed oils, the omega-6 to the omega-3, the cod liver oil, the fish oil, the salmon. Now, if you've watched any of my videos before, you know I love Dr. Barry. And in this segment, he has some unfortunate news that red meat does actually cause inflammation in some people. He's going to tell you who they are and let me know what you think about this. And there is a subset of people for whom red meat, even talking about it, is very, very inflammatory. So it seems when you look at each of the websites that claimed that red meat is inflammatory, such as Cleveland Clinic and Harvard School of Public Health, they believe very strongly in a plant-based diet. They've got a preconceived notion that you should avoid red meat and that you should eat lots of plants. Um, some of them say you can eat some fish or some, or some poultry, but all of them say without a doubt you should minimize or eliminate red meat from your diet. So it seems, it turns out, that the only way that red meat causes inflammation is in the minds of, and the hearts of plant-based believers. It seems that in actual humans who are eating the meat, it doesn't cause any inflammation whatsoever. But if you believe in a plant-based diet and you hear about someone eating red meat, you're liable to get mentally inflamed. Now, Dr. Mark Hyman is a really great doctor. I showed him earlier on this video. He's going to talk about some of the top causes of inflammation, a couple you haven't heard yet, and how to treat them naturally. Because you don't need to go to the doctor and take a bunch of pills to heal this when your body can heal itself with these things that he talks about. Inflammation isn't just there randomly, it's there because there's something causing it. So what are the causes and drivers of inflammation? Well, basically number one, two, and three is diet. And guess what? The number one, two, and three in diet thing is sugar, 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 <laughs> or the equivalent of sugar, starch, starch, starch. So anything that's sugar and starch drives inflammation, particularly high fructose corn syrup. Also inflammatory fats may be a factor. So lots of refined oils, non of omega-3s, trans fat, which have been ruled not safe to eat by the government, but they're still everywhere in food. I don't know how that works to be honest with you. I guess there's little loopholes that the food industry gets to give them maybe years or decades, but this was 2005, seven years ago. They said, hey guys, trans fat kills you, not safe to eat, don't use it. But if you go to the grocery store, you can find it everywhere, which is terrifying. I mean, more and more companies are removing it, but it's still there. Also, what else can cause low-grade inflammation? Sitting on your butt. <laughs> Not exercising. Exercise is a powerful anti-inflammatory. Not over-exercising, not running a marathon, but doing a moderate amount of exercise every day really helps to lower inflammation. Stress, another big cause of inflammation. So nothing we can do about stress. It's out there. Bad things happen. Reading the news. I try to stay away from the news, by the way. It's so stressful. <laughs> like I figure if something really bad is happening, I'll, I'll hear about it. Um, but but uh, the key is to find habits and behaviors that reduce your stress response. Meditation, yoga, you know, hot and cold therapies, massage, breath, breath work, whatever whatever works for you, try it. Uh, also deal with um, toxins. Toxins are also inflammatory. They're called immunotoxins. Low levels, pesticides, chemicals, uh, petrochemicals, heavy metals. I encourage you to go to the Environmental Working Group's website, EWG, and find out how to reduce your exposure through food. Uh, including fruits and vegetables, animal products, fish, household cleaning products, and even skincare products. I mean, did you know that lead is in a lot of lipsticks? <laughs> that a lot of skincare products have petrochemicals that get absorbed through your skin and get in your body and cause harm? Yeah, don't, don't be doing that. So what is inflammation? What's the big deal? Why does it become so dangerous? Well, 
Inflammation is a natural part of your body's function. It's essential. Yes, you cut yourself. What happens? The white blood cells gather. They come to the site to rescue. They create swelling. They bring all kinds of healing factors. And what you see is redness and swelling and pain and heat. That is the classic sign of inflammation in the body. But here's the rub. In the past, most of what we had to deal with was acute things that caused inflammation, like a cut or an infection. But today, our modern lifestyle is driving so much hidden inflammation, systemic chronic inflammation, silent inflammation. It's a silent killer. And it turns out that it's not the kind of inflammation that we are familiar with, like a sprained ankle or a sore throat or something that's an obvious kind of inflammation, the kind that's good. The kind that we're talking about is the kind that's bad and that leads to almost every known disease of aging, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, not to mention things like ADD, depression, obviously autoimmune disease, obviously allergies, asthma, all sorts of gut issues. All these problems are caused by inflammation. Of course, then the question is, what causes inflammation? We're going to get to that. So from a functional medicine perspective, I don't care that you're inflamed. I care about why you're inflamed. Now, this next part is Dr. Sean Baker and actually Dr. Drew. So I guess technically it's six doctors instead of five. But Dr. Sean Baker talks about what reduces inflammation in regards to gut health and really in your total body health. Check it out. Uh, I do think it, it helps to uh, limit uh, gut hyperpermeability. I do think that is a real thing, the so-called leaky gut. I think there's there's mm -hmm. there's lots of lots of research. Alesso Faisano at Boston Children has written extensively about that. And he feels that that is one of the origins of autoimmunity. And I think there's some pretty good evidence to support that. So uh, the researchers in, in Europe uh, have looked at this and they've actually studied carnivore diets in the context of gut permeability. And they've shown conclusively through something called PEG 400, polyethylene glycol 400, that when you put somebody on a carnivore diet, and you administer PEG, you know, polyethylene glycol, that the absorption is decreased dramatically, which is consistent with an intact, you know, gut barrier. I mean, our, our gut is yeah. semi-permeable. There's obviously things have to get in and we mm -hmm. never absorb food, but it, there's a, there's a mm -hmm. issue where it becomes hyperpermeable. And I think that is probably one of the major things that occur. Also, I think it's just good nutrition. And I think also just the elimination of the garbage, because I think, you know, I think 70% of our garbage, our diet is garbage these days. And, you know, as, in, as yeah. you probably noticed on carnivore, there was some level of lack of cravings. I don't know. I mean, most people will comment on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that hungry. was a that was one of the great advantages. I didn't want to. I just yeah. when I, I ate when I was hungry and that was that. <laughs> it was, yeah. And it's, it's, it was it's, a great. It was a, it was a freedom. You, yeah, it is. It is freeing in that regard. And, and that's the problem. We have so many people that are addicted to these hyper palatable foods, which are absolutely 100 percent designed with that intent I mean, so let's go back to dr barry one more time because he talks about the proper human diet and why it's the best diet for inflammation and it's my belief as i believe it is his everybody's definition of a proper human diet is a little different you have to figure out what works for you and what your proper human diet is there's some basic foundational groundwork for a proper human diet but then the building blocks off of that are a little bit different for everybody. So what's yours? Let's let him talk about that just a little bit. But I don't think the majority of us need, you know, seven to 10 cups of salad or, or lots and lots of vegetables. I don't even think currently, I don't think the average human, I don't think the majority of their plate needs to be covered with vegetables or plants of any kind. At this point, I think the majority, the over at least 50 to 99.9% .9 of your plate should be covered with fatty meat and eggs with the yolk. And if you want to add some, some, some veg, some berries, some nuts, I think that's probably fine for most of us, not all of us. Uh, but the more I do this, the less in love with vegetables I am. Me and, thousands of other people who have reached out to me have noticed with 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 low carb keto ketovore carnivore lion any of those diets and you know as well as i do when you start eating a diet that's that's very rich in healthy protein and healthy fat you just automatically you don't eat as often you don't have to snack and so you you effortlessly in in many cases unconsciously you just start to do some daily intermittent fasting and you may not even know that's what it's called. 
And then uh, before long, you're like, man, I, I think I'm going to do a 24 hour fast. Mm-hmm. If for no other reason, just to, to add that to my notch and say, yeah, I've done that. That's no big deal. I, I'm, I'm tough. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm resilient. I'm anti-fragile. I, can, I don't have to eat every day. That's dumb. And so, but we see that our gut bacteria, when we do send it off for testing, which there's a thousand problems with that as well, as you know, uh, it looks like our, our gut bacteria becomes more diverse and it becomes healthier. And, and with almost without exception, I get feedback from keto, ketovore, carnivore people. It's like, man, my, my gut is happier than it's ever been. Uh, and my, my bowel movements are literally a non-issue now. Um, I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. It just kind of happens effortlessly as it should. Much the same way breathing and, and your heart beating and urine output happens. You don't have to track that. You don't have to do anything. It just happens. And I think that's the way it should be. And so I think that when we do start to do meaningful research on fasting and the, the microbiome, I think we're going to see uniformly across the board that, that you're going to downregulate gas forming uh, bacteria and fungi and viruses, right? We have all that in our, in our gut. It's not just bacteria. Bacteria probably play the largest role. But we don't even know that for sure yet because right, there's definitely right. fungi, there's definitely vi- viruses. And we have especially examples in other species where ba- fungi can literally hijack not just your gut. They can hijack the entire organism and make it do things that are exactly contrary to it living right? There's, there's the zombie ants, there's tons of YouTube videos, there's cockroaches that can be, their entire system be hijacked by this fungus. And it makes them go and do things that are just insane from the ants perspective. And so you know that not only has that fungus hijacked the, 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 the ants body, but also its mind as well. And so uh, I think uh, this is one of the reasons a lot of people notice that the sugar addiction, the carb addiction, all that kind of stuff, the food addiction the 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 disordered eating perhaps that is just a consequence of having a very unhealthy gut microbiome from decades of eating a highly processed high carbohydrate factory made diet maybe that encourages the wrong bacteria fungus virus and they're actually using the vagus nerve and other pathways to literally zombify you and make you just sit on the couch and eat more jelly donuts. But we don't know that for a fact, but that makes a lot of sense when we look at other species in the animal kingdom. Yep. So there are roughly two different kinds of inflammation that you can think about in a meaningful way. There's acute inflammation, which comes on suddenly and serves very specific roles. And then there's chronic inappropriate inflammation. And that's, that, that's not 100% true, but that's, that's a good way to think about this. So a couple of years back, I made a, uh, a YouTube video about rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and yeah. anti-inflammatories. Because that's any physical therapist, any orthopedic surgeon, if you sprain an ankle, twist a knee, tweak your, your shoulder, rest, ice, compression, elevation, anti-inflammatories. That's literally what any healthcare provider is going to tell you to do. Uh, but but first of all, this, let's put our three lenses on that, right? Does that make common sense? Well, maybe. What about uh, the past? What about a hundred thousand years ago? Is that what we did? Did we did we go you know run up to the Arctic and stick our eye, our elbow in the snow if if, if we twisted it? Of course not. Uh, now let's look at the physiology of this. What does your body do when you tweak a joint or when you have an acute injury? It causes redness, swelling, pain right? Edema, that's it. It literally makes those things happen. The injury doesn't make those things happen. The four cardinal signs of inflammation, your body does that on purpose. And so if you get a big cut on your arm or you tweak your shoulder, immediately it increases the blood supply and it sends all kinds of inflammatory particles, uh, uh, single, single molecules, and then entire big amino acids and proteins as well to that area to cause redness, to cause pain, to cause swelling, to cause you to not move that shoulder so much, right? That does that for a reason. The inflammation that comes after an uh, acute injury, that is the first step of the healing process. Yeah. Yeah. And so why would you want to re- 
to cripple that? Why would you want to take an anti-inflammatory? Why would you want to ice down this, this, this joint? Think about that for a second. Why would you do that? You're literally fighting against what your body is trying to do as the first step in the healing process. That's similar, and I got similar, to, antioxidants. Uh, That's similar to taking antioxidants during a workout or after a workout, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, but man, I got so much kickback on that video from physical therapists and, and even orthopedic uh, PAs. They're like, what's wrong with you? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but the, the research that does exist is down in the show notes. And it basically shows without exception that if you ice down a joint, not only does it take longer to heal, but you also increase your risk of winding up with chronic mm. disability in that joint, chronic pain in that joint. Uh, and so why would you want to, why wouldn't you let your body just do what it needs to do to fix that? Why would you want to hamper that or interfere with that? Uh, and so now let's talk about chronic inappropriate inflammation. And I think we need to say it that way so that people understand we're talking about a completely different thing. A, a sprained ankle is supposed to be inflamed. That is good. You should be very happy your ankle's swollen up three times its normal size. That's not dangerous. That's not bad. You don't need to ice that down. You need to, to move that ankle as, as pain permits. It's exactly what we did 100,000 years ago. You need to so rest it if that makes it feel better. Uh, but you don't need to, to take a, a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. You don't need to do that. You don't need to block your COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. Those are vital for your body to get the inflammatory things there to start the healing process. Now, chronic inappropriate inflammation is when you have chronic inflammation somewhere that either, number one, your body can't see, number two, it can't get to, or that it's just it, you're, you're constantly putting inflammatory things in your body, and therefore the chronic inappropriate inflammation just persists because you're basically adding a new bit of slow poison every single day to your system. And so that, that is the kind of inflammation that keto, ketovore, carnivore just helps more than any pill in the world. And, uh, you know, I see people when they first start this, they're 300, 400, 500 pounds or more. And, and, and so the average weight loss guru would say, well, you need to eat less and move more. But when you, when you tell somebody who weighs 500 pounds, you need to move more, like literally they don't feel like getting up and going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm because they're so inflamed, they're so miserable, they're so sick, all their joints hurt, all their muscles hurt, because they've been poisoning themselves several times a day, every day for decades. That person cannot move more. Literally, it's, it's, it's uh, the most insensitive thing in the world. If you say that to somebody like that, they, you should just have your, your face slapped because it's a slap in their face to say something like that to them. But also, you've seen this many times, Ben, I'm sure, when somebody does start to lose the weight, yes, but what are they also doing in the background at a cellular level? They're decreasing the chronic inappropriate inflammation in every cell in their body, every joint in their body, every muscle in their body, all the connective tissue and fascia. And all, lo and behold, a few weeks or a few months or sometimes a year or two into this, they're like, you know what? I feel really good today. I think I'm going to fill in the blank with exercise. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm going to go swimming. I'm going to get out and play with my grandkids for the first time in how many years? Because once you've decreased the chronic inappropriate inflammation, you actually feel like doing what is a natural human activity, which is being active and having fun and going outside and playing. But you can't do that when your entire system is just chronically poisoned with the crap that modern technology and modern factories tell you that is healthy, you should eat lots of that. It's a great explanation for everybody to understand acute versus chronic. And that's exactly what happened with me, the way that you explained it. I started to change my nutrition and the weight started to come off. And then I felt a little bit better to start exercising. And that's exactly what I did 14 years ago without even realizing that was happening. And you're right. When we see a health educator, a personal trainer, a fitness coach, or whoever it is saying, yeah, just exercise more and eat less. It's very easy. That is a huge disservice to that person. And that's a big red flag that we don't focus on the calorie cutting. We focus on reducing cellular inflammation. And you do that with so many of the tools that Dr. Kenberry teaches about. So let's talk about what are some hidden causes of inflammation on keto. Let's say somebody's been doing for keto for three months, but their inflammation is still up. What are some hidden things that might be going on? So it's almost certainly not the meat and it's not the eggs 
virtually without exception. Now, there are some very rare exceptions, but for 99.9% .9 of people watching this, it's invariably going to turn out to be uh, something in the vegetables that's causing inflammation. It's going to turn out to be something in the nuts that you're eating that you're very sensitive to that's causing the inflammation. It could be even be something in the berries that you're eating. It could be something in the, the, the seven to 10 cups of salad that you, you know, you heard this guru say that you should eat that every day. That could very well be continuing your chronic inappropriate inflammation. And so that's why I love the carnivore diet. If for nothing else, a 90 day elimination diet, a, a 90 day reset to just basically remove any potentially offending agents out of your diet and then after that 90 days when you've given the chronic inappropriate inflammation time to calm down and you've given your body a chance to heal uh, you're going to also be doing some 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 unconscious intermittent fasting if, if not more during that 90 days because it just happens you can't help it then your then your rate of autophagy your rate of mitophagy are going to increase you're going to start replacing old damaged cells and mitochondria and tissues and before you know it you're going to feel much better overall. And, it, and it, it, most people describe it as just a, a whole body sense of, man, I feel better. It's, it's not necessarily a certain body part feels better. It's just, I just feel better. And I think a big part of that's mental as well. Don't you, Ben? I think, I think a big part of, of mental illness of disordered eating that comes from this chronic inappropriate inflammation and perhaps our gut bacteria, viruses, and fungi telling us to do inappropriate activities that are not really for our reproduction in long life, they're actually for the bacteria or the virus or the fungus. Uh, but but I think that that's why the the 90 day beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, like Neil just said in the comments, that kind of thing, then you can start to add back in. Well, let's try some broccoli. Let's see what happens. Let's try some spinach. Let's yeah. try some of those cashews because I freaking love cashews. Same. I do too. But I know that I know for a fact now because I've done the personal experiment multiple times because I keep thinking, well, then maybe it wasn't the cashews because I sure do love them. But then every time I add them back, it's like, shit. Yeah, it was a cashew. Okay. All right. Yeah, exactly. Same goes for cheese for me. Maybe not everybody, but for me, definitely – uh, even real full fat fermented cheese, the hard as a rock, you can throw it to, at somebody and knock them out. Uh, too much of that still causes inflammation. And, what about and, goat, goat and sheep? Are you good with that? Yeah. Yeah, and that's great. So let's let's just go right into dairy because I think that's a very important topic that, that we all need to not only discuss, but think about. Think about this very carefully. So I do think without a doubt for most people, goat and sheep's milk is less inflammatory than the, the average uh, bovine or cow's milk you would get in the grocery. Uh, but now, common sense, right? Less bad does not equal good. You have to come to grips with that. Less bad does not mean good. Uh, a lot of people will misphrase that. They'll be like, well, goat's milk and sheep's milk, that's much better. And I think that's, that's, that's not the right way to say it. Because if you say that, better, that implies, wow, that's good. But I don't think we need to imply that because I think there's a, 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 a in the same vein, I think raw milk, if properly handled, is less inflammatory, and less bad than the homogenized, pasteurized factory milk that you get in, in the supermarket. But that does not make it good. OK, there is no mammal on the planet that drinks milk as an adult unless human beings are involved. Milk is a great source of calories. If you are starving to death, you should drink all the milk you can get your hands on of whatever quality. But if what you're trying to do here is optimize your health to be as physiologically and as mentally young as possible and as uninflamed as possible, then it's highly likely that any part of dairy other than butter or ghee, which are essentially just the fat component of dairy, which I think the fat component is fine for most everybody, but the protein component, the casein, there's, there's, there's lots of research that people are sensitive to the casein that they are sensitive. And that's what goes into cheese, right? That's, that's the part, the way it gets left behind the casein is what goes in to the cheese. And I think for many, many people, including me, it's the casein which is just one of the dairy proteins. There's hundreds of them. Uh, and so that's why I think, I think dairy for many people, it, it might get you to a certain point along your journey back to good health, but it's not going to get you all the way. 
And that when I first started keto, son, I was smashing some cheese, the Parmesan, uh, the Romano, all of it. I was wearing it out, the goat cheese, the sheep's cheese, and I still love it all. So once again, this is a guy I grew up, I was a milk baby. When I was in high school, I played three sports and I would drink a gallon of 2% milk every single day nice. because I thought that would make me strong and, you know, everything that a 15 year old boy wants to be. But it turns out that's all. That was all dumb. That was just me thinking I knew, but I didn't really know. But now looking back, if I if I could go back in time and actually say, "Hey, dummy, no, stop that," then my acne would have got much better. My dandruff would have got much better. All the little chronic weird things that I hated about my teenage body would have gotten better. But I didn't know that at the time, right? And so I think I think dairy is the downfall of many people because. Yes, cheeses can be super, super low carb. Yes, 100%. Yes, it can be very high fat. Yes, that's true. But keto is more than just macros. Macros matter. Macros are important. But that's it. That's not all there is to it. If that were the case, then you could just eat all the keto cookies, cakes, pies, you know, desserts, drink all the keto shakes, and eat all the keto bars, and, and just look like uh, Ben does. But you, but you can't do that long term. Now they might help you initially, yeah. but they're not going to get you to your best health. That's just not that's not how the human body works. You have to eat things that are ancient. You have to you have to honor this body. You have to honor where it came from. Honor what got it here. And if you don't do that, you will suffer to the degree to which you dishonor your DNA. And there's thousands of people in the challenge. We have a combination of those who are brand new to keto those who have been doing it for months to years, just to kind of recap with what, what Dr. Ken Berry said, he's not saying that dairy and vegetables, he's not saying that you should not have dairy and vegetables. He's saying if you're new to keto, maybe that's a good transition for you to get into more of a healthier lifestyle. But eventually there's going to be a point, and I agree, where you need to upgrade your results. You want to upgrade what you're getting. So that at that point, it might be a good idea to explore, okay, am I having casein? Am I having too many uh cashews like ken Bray was having do i still feel optimal or do i still feel a little off and you start to eliminate a few things that's where a carnivore could be so terrific it's the ultimate elimination diet you do it and then when you experience those amazing carnivore benefits 69 days in you could do that experiment let me introduce cashews back into the mix oh i got joint pain again okay cashews don't agree with me but it's so custom to you and your unique needs. Somebody could have those foods and feel really great. Most people probably not. So I hope that kind of unpacks it. Is that fair to kind of yep. summarize that, Ken? Okay. I think that's well said, yeah. And let's go a step further, Ben. Let's not just say that the standard American diet's a fad diet. I totally agree. But let's also go a step further and say, well, what about the American Diabetes Association? What about their recommended diet? Does that diet have lots of, of randomized control research showing that it's safe for long-term human consumption? No, none. What about the American Heart Association's DASH diet? Has that been proven to be safe and effective for long-term use in humans? Mm -hmm. No. What about whole food plant-based? Has that been proven to be, to be safe and effective for long? No, none of this. So none of these diets have the proof that they then turn around and say, well, you need to do long-term term studies in keto before you recommend it because we don't know if it's safe or not. Well, where are the long-term studies on the ADA diet, the AHA diet, the whole, whole foods plant-based? Where are the long-term studies showing that you're not going to develop vitamin or mineral deficiencies, that you're not going to develop omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies, certain amino acid deficiencies? There's none. There is no research. And so uh, the, the keto diet, ketovore, carnivore, they are just as unresearched as all the other diets that, that your doctor actually recommends. You know, that little handout that they give you here, eat like this. There's no research to support that handout. None. No meaningful research whatsoever. And so don't feel like you're doing some weird sciencey. Oh, my God, it's keto. It sounds really weird. No, all you're doing is you're removing all of the modern foods. And let's put that in quotes, modern foods. You're removing all the factory made crap and you're just eating real human food that we've had access to for tens of thousands of years. Right out of the gate, how could that even be dangerous? You're eating foods that we've eaten since before we even started recording history. That can't be dangerous. That has to be good for you. 
And so when you comp compare two ounces of one food versus two ounces of the other, another food, how many vitamins, how many minerals, how much uh, amino acids, how many fatty acids, when you compare two ounces of any meat, even the cheapest supermarket beef you can find, even spam, even uh, what's the cheapest meat you can, the bologna, right? Just the cheap bologna. It is still more nutrient dense than two ounces of the most pristine non-GMO organic vegetable, whatever your favorite vegetable is. And you can actually look this up and compare the nutrition density between any, any plant and any animal. The animal food is always more nutrient dense. It, it's literally not even a conversation. It's not even close. The meat always blows the veg away every single time. Uh, but you'll learn that as you come, as you see, and there are charts people have done, they've compared blueberries or kale to red meat. And it, the red meat just blows the kale away. It's not even close. But we've been taught our entire life that kale is a superfood, blueberries, Aussie berry, all these plants are superfoods. When in reality, the ultimate superfood is animal liver. That's the ultimate superfood. There's nothing that even comes close to that, Naomi. But uh, I, I totally understand where you're at right now. But I promise you, as you learn more and more, you're going to be like, uh, yeah, plants are uh, plants are fine for garnish and for seasoning. Uh, and if you love them, you can eat uh, some plants. That's fine. But that's not where you get nutrition from. Now, last but not least, I promised you the number one food that you can eat to help reduce inflammation and why it works. Here's Dr. Berg to tell you all about it. So now let's talk about the most important food to get rid of your inflammation. This food has a very high level of glutamine. In fact, if you look at all the foods out there with the highest level of glutamine, it would be this food. But let me just explain what glutamine is. It's an amino acid for your colon cells, which is a single layer of cells that line the inside of your colon. This forms the barrier to your immune system deeper inside, but your intestinal cells are very hungry for glutamine. In fact, out of all the glutamine, they hog like 30% of it, okay, for themselves. Glutamine is very important in producing ATP energy. Glutamine fuels the intestinal layer of the cells as well as the mucosal layer where all the good bacteria hang out. And glutamine supports tight junctions. You see, I originally talked about this gut being a source of inflammation, but I didn't describe exactly what's occurring. What's occurring is leaky gut, which is intestinal hyperpermeability. You basically have holes in this single layer cell that goes right in and larger molecules of food that are not broken down can get through there. And then your immune system tags them as a foreign entity to be destroyed. And that's when you start developing antibodies and allergies against foods. So this problem really is a bypass of normal immigration. It doesn't give the normal stamp of approval through the immune system, and it gets through and it creates a lot of problems for you. So all of those bad foods I talked about kind of put a hole through your intestine. And glutamine is the solution for that. But now the question is, what food has the most glutamine? And the answer is meat, specifically beef, the thing that they're trying to get rid of right now. They're trying to get rid of cows because of just some ridiculous reason, but beef gives you a super healing protein, glutamine, that can greatly support your gut and other types of inflammatory conditions, whether you have an autoimmune or some other type of non-autoimmune joint problem. Or whatever. Now, you can actually take glutamine as well, but beef is the best anti-inflammatory food that you can possibly eat. In fact, before the ketogenic diet, when I was eating all those carbs, and when I switched over to beef, oh my goodness, did I feel better. It was incredible. I no longer had bloating, and it was really weird because I thought that you needed fiber to kind of push things through, but little did I know that beef really calmed the fire down in my gut. And a lot of inflammatory conditions went away. I had arthritis so bad in my hands and my spine, I had no idea it was connected to my diet and primarily all the carbs and grains I was consuming. You just have to try it. Let's say that you're a vegan and you want to know what is the best vegan source of glutamine. Ready for this? Cabbage. That's right. Especially red cabbage, but all cabbage is loaded with glutamine. 
So those are the two foods that have the most glutamine if you were to look at like just the spectrum of a meat and a vegetable. And this is also what I talk about in other videos using like cabbage for gastritis or an ulcer or any type of GI inflammatory condition. Um, you can't really do a lot of other vegetables and fiber, but that's the one that most people can deal with, especially if you do it in a fermented form, the sauerkraut, because that way you get all this glutamine from the, the vegetable, but you get the microbes as well. Now, there are other things that are loaded with glutamine as well. You have cheese from either a sheep or a goat or the um, kefir, like I mentioned. You also have eggs and fish and especially bone broth, okay, that's loaded with glutamine. So now I kind of simplified how to heal your inflammation and gave you the things that you need to avoid to really turn this thing around. I'm telling you, if you have inflammation, I don't care what kind, you should start eating these foods. These I would start basically eating beef and cabbage and just watch what happens to your inflammation. I think you'll be quite surprised. If you enjoyed this video, check this one out right here. I think it's something that you're going to enjoy and let me know what you think. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video.